So welcome to our guest speaker, a guest speaker event with Raffaello Nenni, who is an, uh, a friend of mine, but is also a business associate. We've known each other for probably over 20 years uh, in private capacity and also in a professional capacity in the banks. He worked in banks, I work in banks, and in wealth management and, and so forth and so on. He's got a, a very long history in uh, wealth management and private banking. He's going to talk about it. He worked for some really top institutions, including Deutsche Bank, uh, HSBC, UBS, uh, Bank Safra, and, uh, and he's got a lot of interesting things to tell us a bit about private banking, wealth management. Obviously, this is a wealth management class, but is, 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 is connected to, uh, obviously, private banking, what private banks do. And he can also give us a little bit of an insight into what are the difference between private banking and wealth management. And if you have any questions later, you can ask questions perhaps about Korea and so on. So over to you, Rafael. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Jacob, for inviting me, first of all, and sharing my experience, which I hope you will find interesting. Out of interest, anyone is interested in pursuing a career in wealth management? To show of hands. Good. Okay, we have two, maybe. Well, as a matter of fact, when I was sitting in your position, I was not really even thinking of going wealth management. And I think. Eventually, situation happens in life, and uh, you find your, your way. Uh, in my case, I, I grew up in Italy, and uh, I was educated in Italy and uh, as an economist. And my first instinct was to go and pursue an academic career, because I was really interested in, in, uh, in research. Um, but through few connections, I came across some people that uh, offered me the opportunity to come to London from Milan. I didn't speak a word of English, still have a strong accent, but it's never going to go away. Um, and they said they were actually planning to set up an asset management firm. I said, okay, I'll stay there for a few weeks. Uh, as a matter of fact, after a few weeks turned into months, months into years, and now I've been here for more than 30 years. So um, I came to London and, uh, and uh, these two partners set up this asset management firm and as a matter of fact it turned out that we didn't have main clients. You know how many clients we had? Just one. And, uh, and it was a very wealthy family and uh, the purpose of this asset management firm was to manage the wealth of this family. Uh, I called it the single family office. At, at the time, in the early 90s, family office did not exist, the term. So we were calling ourselves asset management. As a matter of fact, we were a single family office. And, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with family offices, but depending by the family circumstances, each family office is very different from, the, from another, because there are some situations where a family sold their business and they want to have somebody to look after, which is independent. Some others have still existing business and they want to have somebody that manage their, their business, but in a sort of way that is a different capacity from the corporate vehicle they are investing to. So when they say, well, you pursue a career in, uh, in family office, it doesn't really exist for a career in family office. Depends on, on the specific family office you're working with. And it turned out that we had only just essentially one, one family and friends which were somewhat connected to the family. And um, I learned a lot during those years. I spent that 10 years. Because there were years where there was a lot of volatility in the markets. Uh, the investment world was really developing at a much faster pace than before. And, uh, and it turned out that the family was a very sophisticated investor. So we were investing as proprietary, so on our own books on fixed income in bonds. And people think bonds are boring. As a matter of fact, bonds are not boring at all. Because, for instance, I started in 91. In 94, we had an unexpected six interest rate rises by the Federal Reserve. That nobody was expecting it. There was a collapse in the market. And when you leverage, so you, take, you borrow also money to invest, your, your investments are much more volatile. So it's, it, becomes, it becomes quite exciting, but also a risky business. So you really need to know what you're doing. And uh, that's what we're actually doing. We were investing in, in fixed income markets. 
in a way which was very sophisticated. We're not just buying bonds, but typically we were valuing different securities and to see which one was attractive, but the other one which was expensive. We were buying the attractive, selling the, the, most, the more expensive one, try to, to, to benefit and, 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 and make money out of it. But also we were allocating money to, to, to the most sophisticated investors because we were good at managing uh, fixed income portfolios, but we did not have the experience. We are, we are a four, four people band. Eventually it was 10, but not more. So you cannot say, well, we can manage everything in all the markets. So we start allocating to hedge funds. And you are probably very familiar with names like George Soros, uh, Julian Robertson, probably less because he retired since then, Louis Baker, all these very I would say uh, uh, hedge fund manager that really forged the hedge fund industry at its infancy, and um, and that those were very uh, formative uh, formative years. And as I said, we I I, I saw in, and and I was managing portfolios during those crises, and though you learn a lot of lessons there, uh, when you have a PNL and you open your spreadsheet and you see the PNL. Uh, swings, it's much more different your behavior, like instead of just advising people what to do, because the, 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 the behavioral um, way how we how react is very, very different. Um, and that's also 1998. All these crises are somewhat forgotten because we had the 2008, but 1998, probably, uh, I don't know if you were born, but it's such 1998 was uh, the default of Russia. We're talking about now the situation in Ukraine. But Russia defaulted in 1998, and nobody was expecting that. And there was uh, the largest hedge fund in the world, called LTCM, Long Term Capital Management, that became insolvent at the time. And he had such a huge position. So we were, in a sense, a very micro replica of what Long Term Capital Management was doing, in a sense, similar strategies. But they were so big that the whole financial institution were very concerned about the stability of the market. And uh, there are fantastic books you should read about it, what, how they handled the situation. Uh, they essentially handed the book of their investment to a consortium of banks that over time managed the, the positions. And as a matter of fact, eventually they even made money. But at the time, they were essentially insolvent because they were on margin calls. So they, uh, the banks and people that were lending money to them required more money in order for them to hold positions. But this, this was a very, very, very uh, formative year for me. Um, and after 10 years in, the bank, in, in, this, in this single family office, for a number of reasons which are not, nothing to do with the investment uh, performance that we had, uh, there was a change in the, in, uh, in, in the family, and uh, the, essentially the family office decided to do other things, which is other than investment. So I started wondering myself, what am I going to do now? I work for one family, as I said at the beginning. Each family office is very different from the other, so what do I do? <laughs> so I start applying uh, uh, to job, jobs in different banks, probably nine out of ten were uh, straight rejections. Until uh, until uh, I was uh, uh, I was approached by Headhunter that had the mandate to hire for uh, a, a startup bank in the UK. As a matter of fact, if I tell you which one, UBS is not really a startup, but in the UK <laughs> was a startup. Uh, very few of us in the UK, and the view was to build the UK business. They're very big in Switzerland, in the Middle East. Um, in uh, somewhat they started investing in Asia, but they said, well, the, now the wealth is going to, instead of uh, uh, coming offshore, will be created uh, onshore, so in, in domestic market. And we don't have, they did not have a presence in, in London, a significant in, in, in France, in Italy, in Spain. So they decided they to invest in those markets. And, uh, and they were hiring like, there's no tomorrow, essentially. If you had some skills, that were somewhat portable into the role, they were giving you a chance. And uh, that's what happened to me. So I was one of the 150 relationship manager hired during those years. And I uh, and said, so listen, you're, you're Italian, UK market, give the chance. I said, okay, give the chance. I said, so that's what I did. Um, and how do you start? I mean, uh, I will tell you a bit uh, the role later on about the relationship manager. But 
it boils down to getting clients. So uh, uh, sign up clients that become your clients where you can manage the relationship. I had no idea. So I said, well, Italian in the UK, there's a big Italian community. I start doing a lot of research and start cold calling people. Again, out of our 100, 90 were straight rejection. 10 were maybe, and five you get a meeting, and essentially one becomes a client. <laughs> Those are the statistics. So if I, one uh, uh, lesson that I learned is that you need a lot of drive and consistency because it's not a business that people are going to knock at the door and say, well, I want to bank with you. Um, so uh, I started uh, building some, 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 some clients there and it turned out to be quite a successful, successful venture for me. Of course, you have the anxiety at the beginning to build a book, but eventually after six years, or six years I built over a billion uh, Swiss francs at the time of, of clients, so which was, was uh, uh, quite, uh, quite remarkable uh, in terms of, uh, of results of new joiners. Um, then, uh, uh, actually I didn't put it, but it's actually, as a matter of fact, it, it, it is, uh, you mentioned Safra. I, I was approached uh, by a family that wants to establish uh, a, a, UK, a UK presence. They used to have in the family, uh, the Safra family, and, uh, and they wanted to rebuild a private banking presence here. And I said, well, this is a different kind of role. Uh, it doesn't happen every day that, uh, that uh, somebody offers you to start a bank from scratch, essentially. And that's what I did. Uh, unfortunately, the timing was not great. It was 2008. So I set up the bank uh, from the regulatory point of view, but commercially it was not the ideal time. So the, the, uh, the project of the rolled out was postponed. So in a way, I found myself, OK, what am I going to do now? Because 2008, 2009, who knows whether banks are going to still exist or um, or anything will happen in general to private banking. So I started wondering what to do. And, um, and uh, since I had a very good experience with UBS, I, I decided to, to, to join uh, a Credit Suisse that somewhat uh, uh, navigated the turbulence of 2008 much better and had a quite strong London presence. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of each role because I, I will find it very boring uh, probably for you. But I think a, few, a, a couple of common denominators here is that I moved from a, a pure relationship role where I was just dealing with clients into a leadership role, so where I start managing teams. And uh, you start to be a bit detached by the clients because you have to manage the team and the business. But the common denominator of those, of those roles is that I always try to find what client wants. Because as a matter of fact, it's very difficult to sell something that clients don't want. If you don't want an ice cream here, there's no way I'm going to sell you an ice cream and try to. But if you, if you try to understand what the trends are and where the opportunity is, you can build a business, even in large banks. And that was the case for Credit Suisse, where uh, there was a specific, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's quite complex to explain, but essentially uh, if you are a, a, a living in the UK and you were born in the UK and your family has been in the UK for many, many years, you are, you are resident in the UK, of course, but also your domicile. Domicile means it's, it's to do with your origins. Whilst if, like me or some of you, I'm sure, moved into the UK, the, uh, the, the tax authority recognized that the, your status is different because the domicile, i.e. your origin and where you feel at home is not really in the UK. And there are tax advantages. But it's a very complex area and nobody had a, a, a focus on this page. There were competencies, but there were no real focuses. That's what I, I, I persuaded the, 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 the top manager at the Credit Suisse to, to focus on. And we were very successful in building that business. Similarly, at HSBC, uh, HSBC uh, is not a small bank, as you can imagine. Uh, but senior manager uh, realized that uh, we had different clients with different experience, with different needs, always sort of managed without any focus. And, uh, and uh, the time senior manager there, they said, well, why don't you 
Raffaello build a proposition which is closer to the wealthier part of the clients, their high net worth, ultra high net worth, which is typically clients that are at least 20 or 30 million of investable assets, and come with, with a proposition that it's really resonates with their needs. And that's what I did with a number of my colleague, colleagues to really bring all the group's capability of the bank into the clients. Uh, navigate in a big bank is very difficult, even if you try with your own retail bank, it's a nightmare. If you try instead to, to find a specialist in, uh, in, in different in a financial institutions, it's very, very complicated. That's why having a team that can help you and bring the solution to your, to your door is much more effective. What I'm doing now, it's, uh, I'm going back probably to my, to my starting point in a sense where I I, I'm an advisor to family offices. I, for, for families that don't have the size of a family office, uh, to establish a, a, a family office on their own, and there the are costs involved. You need an office, you need full-time employees, sometimes you need to be regulated. It's very complex, so you cannot do it for 50 million or 100 million. Start to be meaningful, probably, 250, 300 million. So for people that don't have that kind of money, but they have those needs, they will need to outsource at least some of those roles. And that's what I do uh, part-time. And another part of, the, of, of, uh, of, my, uh, of what I'm doing now is uh, uh, investing in wealth management firms. I think there are, without going into too much in the details, but uh, there, there's uh, big, big changes in the landscape of wealth management and I think there are opportunities to bring from one, one category to clients to the other very effectively and being very, very profitable. Um, I'm just not going to go uh, to each slide, otherwise it's going to take too long. But, but for people that are considering why private banking, I mean private banking very, in, in a few words, it's, it's something that's always existed since, uh, you know, for, for more than a thousand years because people uh, 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 intuitively have figured out that uh, the needs of very wealthy merchants, for instance, in the 12th or the 13th century, or aristocracy or royalty were very different from common people. So they need to have some specific uh, needs, but clearly it's grown dramatically in the last 20, 30 years, especially after the, uh, after, after, uh, the, the, the 2008 crisis, because banks have realized that this is a, a very good business to be in. First of all, because the business is growing, and I will show you in a few slides very quickly how the business is growing, I mean in terms of wealthy clients that are becoming wealthier, and now the number of, 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 of people that are becoming wealthier, but also is not very risky as perceived by the regulators. So uh, investment banking is perceived as a very risky business because you have to trade uh, you know, with your own capital and there's a risk for retails. Now it's changed the regulation, but clearly that was perceived as a very risky activity. Was here, essentially, you're advising management. So it's relatively riskier, uh, less, uh, less, less risky. And also has a benefit for banks to have people that are dedicated to look after the most important clients. Because at the end of the day, you get more business. Because if uh, you advise a client to your portfolio, but you start a conversation, they are trying to sell their company. Clearly, you can refer that to, to your uh, mergers and acquisition colleagues, and the business stays in the group. Um, one of my, uh, the CEO, the group CEO of one of the largest institutions that uh, worked, it was a very, uh, it was a big family business, although it was a mean, really a meaningless part of the business, the private banking. But he said, you know, one thing that irritates me the most when I go in Asia or I go in the Middle East or go in Europe and I speak to my, uh, to, and I have lunch with the biggest clients of the group and, and they start talking about the business and they say, what do you do with the private wealth? Well, I bank with a competitor that was driving him, cra driving him crazy because this is probably an opportunity for a competitor to step in into, into the into the uh, relationship. For individual, uh, for individual, it's a very exciting business. Uh, I'll tell you a bit 
there are a few words of caution, but <laughs> it's a very, very exciting because it's business that you can do all your life. Um, uh, if, you, if you go and you work in a trading room, you hardly see somebody my age. Actually, you probably won't see anybody in my age. Probably at 40, 45, you already start hitting the door because, I mean, <laughs> I mean it's not a business where uh, people can stay for long. Whilst you acquire wisdom and experience with, uh, with, 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 uh, with, your, with your, in your work, and clearly that comes across as very appreciated by clients. So it's something they can do that really for you for, for, for until you retire. And, um, and also, as I said, for people that like building relationship, makes, it makes, uh, it's a quite an attractive proposition and, uh, and it requires a broad knowledge, a lot of things. Uh, whereas investment banking, I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue it, but, but it's very different, it's very narrow. If you do derivatives, equity derivatives, that's what you do. Uh, you don't do cash derivatives because it's a different world. Um, so that is uh, that is why, in my opinion, it's attractive for individuals. This is very quickly to show how the the number of high net worth and uh, uh, clients uh, and individuals are growing, especially in area like the U.S. and Asia Pacific, uh, in terms of numbers and in terms of wealth. The quite unusual things that happened in the last year or so, U.S actually is growing more than, um, in terms of wealth per individual, more than the Asia. Very strange, this had not happened before, but really that was the result of the explosion of the financial market in terms of, 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 of trends in the markets, where the market went up so much and, and the portion of financial assets that those clients have is much higher in, in, uh, in the US than uh, Asia, where most, uh, most of these uh, clients, these individuals, are very much in their own business more than actually financial assets. Uh, but clearly, this is, uh, in terms of, it's growing 6-7% uh, a year, and, uh, and it's been going on for many, many years. So the underlying client base and the market is growing. You can see that the US is a predominant, uh, the predominant market. Uh, you can see there's a big gap between the US China is growing very much. China is growing very, very much. And um, no surprise, growth. Growth uh, typically is led uh, you know, by companies that are successful and, uh, and people that have exposure and uh, have part of total ownership clearly have, have, have a, a, a take benefit of that. Whilst Europe um, has, been, has, has been fairly stagnant in these, in these dynamics. That's why most of the private banks are really investing in, in Asia because the market where it's growing the most. And, and, uh, and in the US, you need to have presence. And that's why amongst the largest private banks in the world are in, 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 uh, in the US, with the exception of, uh, of Switzerland, that has always had a, a dominant role because of the neutrality and stability of the, of the country. Uh, but if you going back to China, you will see that China really leapfrog uh, in terms of the ranking quite dramatically. If you were, uh, if you look this graph, um, China in uh, just over uh, just 20 years ago was like the U.S. in 1920. Uh, but it leapfrogged, and now it's about it's about like like 2004, 2005, like it was U.S. Just in 20 years. And is expected to grow, to, to overtake the U.S. Uh, uh, in this decade. So China is really growing. Um, and in terms of segmentation, and I will tell you about segmentation later on. Uh, later on, the high net worth and the ultra high net worth are the ones that are growing the most. So uh, people with liquid assets, forget about the house, forget about uh, collectible. If you have, I don't know, cars, but financial assets, um, the, 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 the 5 to 30 and the 30 plus are the ones that are growing the most in terms of, uh, in terms of market trends. Here with uh, just, uh, just a graph showing you how, who are the biggest players and uh, funny enough, mention 
very briefly probably because I mentioned the financial crisis, uh, Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley took, uh, for instance, a, a decision to invest more in investment management in, in, in private banking. They were, as you probably know, one of the leading investment banks in the US. It's still one of the largest, but they say this is a market that shareholders will understand, regulators will understand, and will give us much more stability in our revenues. Why stability on our Probably I have not explained why it's stable. Because you typically charge a client an annual fee. So unless the client goes, you get that fee every year. Uh, of course, the trick is to add more clients. But if, you, if you're in investment banking, you start on the 31st of December is one thing. On the 1st of January, you start from zero. You have to create again. So it's much more volatile. And if you have a situation where there are, I don't know, a financial crisis, clearly uh, uh, revenues on investment banking get great, greatly affected. This is in simple terms, but reality is not that simple. But in reality, uh, it's the quality of, of the annuity revenues perceived by investors as, as a better way to, to invest, uh, uh, invest in, in those companies that, that, that have that feature. I mentioned the client segmentation because uh, banks are tending more and more to segment the client. I mentioned to you that I used to work in a family office, which is the top of the thing. Right? Uh, clients have very different needs from an affluent. Uh, a client, for instance, got between 500 and 5 million. Probably uh, Jacob uh, explained and did your course what you typically do. Uh, you probably do a financial planning, uh, a financial plan, a financial plan. So sometimes you go and speak to the client and say, okay, what, are, what is your income? What are your expenditures? Uh, do you have a mortgage? Do you put some money on the side uh, to save? You got a pension? All these sort of things, which are very important. Um, clearly, a client with 30 million or 100 million, yes. Pension is not really a game changer for them. Uh, there are other things which are more complicated. Most of the time they have businesses, most of the time have an extended family, some of them living maybe in the US, some of them in Switzerland, some in the UK, so the tax regimes are different. Each one has different aspirations. Some of them want to be in the business, some others want to enjoy life. And clearly, the, what I mentioned here, family governance is very different. So you need to, to have a way where everybody's happy. And, uh, and, and that's why it's important most of the time to have almost a constitution, how the family works. So there are no disagreements, essentially. Uh, sometimes, yes, there are heated discussion. But eventually, if that process is managed well, that is a guarantee, you know, the prosperity for the future because everybody knows his role and he knows what expectations are. They're not infights, which are clearly not some, something that you want to really to try to avoid. In family office space, they almost act like um, like an institution. So uh, they sometimes they manage, like in my case, we were managing assets uh, ourselves. Sometimes you allocate to asset managers. So it's very different from. I would say high net worth clients where typically uh, you offer an investment solution uh, within your firm. That necess not necessarily means that you have to manage really each component of the portfolio yourself, but essentially it's under an umbrella of, of, of a single institution. But clearly the more you go up the scale, the more complex are wealth planning needs and also what they're looking for is the arrangement. Typically, also in terms of relationship, when you deal with a high net worth, on, sometimes with an ultra, but most of the time high net worth and affluent, they, tr they tend to rely on you on anything. So they are not going to have five banks. They are going to have one, maximum two. Also because it becomes very inefficient also to track how your investments are going. Also having a, a consistent dialogue with, uh, with your relationship manager um, whilst on, um, uh, on the family office, uh, they mentioned that I act like a, a semi-institutional, uh, uh, like in a semi-institution, clearly it's a different, uh, it is a different approach. You have professional that deal with professional and 
there, there's a, the, 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 the tendency to bank with a lot of institutions, uh, specifically in, in certain aspects where they perceive that institution the best at what they're doing. So they might do, I don't know, a high yield portfolio with a US manager, and they might have a distressed debt with a, a French company, who knows? But essentially, that's, they have this ability and the resources to pick the best and they consolidate that in a solution for the family. Jumping a bit into the, the, the role in private banking, I mean, sometimes people don't really see what uh, what's up there in a sense. No, so if you go in a private bank, what's behind the door? Typically, there's there's a front office where people that are dealing directly with clients and uh, a support and control, or you call it back office, but it's not really. So it's more a support and a control of the function of of the front office. The generalists, as I mentioned before, are the relationship managers. But typically now it's more and more relying more on specialists that are colleagues. So for instance, you have a specialist portfolio manager that uh, helps in building the portfolio, or you have a wealth planner that helps you in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in designing the best strategy for the client, uh, especially because the, the landscape keeps changing, so you cannot keep up with all, the, uh, with all the changes. So you need somebody that is really focused on that. And when it's required lending specialists, they allow you to to, to provide uh, lending solutions. And then you have all the support functions. So the difference between generalists and specialists, the generalist is, has got always an ongoing dialogue with clients. Whilst the, the, wealth, um, the, the wealth planners, the investment advisors, most of the time is ad hoc for specific subjects. They are, don't speak all the time with clients. Um, the support and control typically don't speak to clients. So, just very quickly how the role has evolved. Um, before, you were just talking to clients only on one thing, investments, and that's it. And the client was having different, different uh, uh, dialogue with a lawyer, with a tax advisor, with his business partners. Now you tend to be very much aware of all what's going on with the client. And the client brings in you, if you're good, into the conversation because everything is interconnected. So when he wants to make sure that the overall plan makes makes uh, makes sense. So that's why um, now now I think in a sense being a generalist allows you much more to, uh, to build deeper relations with, uh, with clients. Before was just how my portfolio is going, and typically before a relationship manager was managing directly the portfolio. Now, as I mentioned. Most of the time, you rely on specialists. And now, also, um, uh, uh, you tend to focus only on one market. Before, you could have clients in South Africa, Middle East, France. Now, it's very, very different. Uh, you have to focus on the market because you need to have expertise in that market uh, because uh, things are becoming, becoming much more complex. And, and there's a much more, as I said, a, an approach which is uh, focus on the, uh, each segment. So you tend to focus on one segment, either affluent, either in ultra high net worth or high net worth. Um, here, for people that are considering a, uh, a role in, in, in private banking, this is just to uh, highlight what typically is required. In the UK, uh, which is a highly regulated um, uh, market, uh, you need to obtain a qualification, an industry standard qualification, and there are various levels. The entry level for to be hired, not to be hired, but actually to start advising clients is level four um, of the CISI, which is the Chartered, Chartered Institute of Securities uh, Investments. Uh, but most of the banks now are requiring level six, which is a few modules more. But this is actually, it's, uh, it's industry standard. Uh, um, so it's really required. Um, then you go through an internal training. And, uh, and there's a quite a long period of, men uh, of mentoring and shadowing uh, by experienced uh, relationship managers. Uh, unfortunately, this is the other side of a, a, a role that is for your life. It's quite a slow burning. Uh, stepping into this role it takes time, takes years. People are quite anxious. Well, I'm going to speak to client immediately. As a matter of fact, it takes time. It 
takes time. But if you find that that's one of the suggestions, typically, if you find the right setup where you get involved from day one in a number of of interactions is not that boring. I mean, you can be part of a team, so probably you're not going to be on the driving seat day one, but you learn a lot from, from experience of successful uh, uh, colleagues. Um, and how is a major relationship manager once when you become a relationship manager is net new assets. So at the end of the day, it's a very crude measure. How much money have you brought this year? That could be for new clients, or from existing clients, so increasing the share of wallet, i.e. managing more share of the wallet of the, of the existing client, and demonstrating that you are increasing, increasing the revenues. Um, this is a, uh, just <laughs> an example of a typical day or, or relationship. The only thing that is wine and dine actually has changed a lot, probably before, before my time, or, or maybe I, I caught the last tail of that, but it's not there anymore. But actually, playing golf is quite an advantage because it allows you to network with some people. But uh, I think there's a lot of research uh, that goes into, into uh, finding the right clients. So especially in transparent market, it's important that you develop an expertise. You might want to sh manage the money of very senior private equity people. So you start to understand you know, who are the participants who are successful, how they are getting uh, 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 compensated. And that actually helps a lot in, in your credibility vis-a-vis -vis the client. And then, of course, you, you do client pitches. So you, you try to attract clients. And uh, for the existing clients, you have to keep in contact. It's very important to keep clients uh, 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 in contact with the existing clients. And then there's, there's a lot of anxiety, and, and, uh, and sometimes people are still complaining, well, I don't have enough time to spend with the client. As a matter of fact, the, uh, it, there is there's some truth. I mean, the regulatory demand now is becoming quite intense, and it's important that uh, we comply with you know, the, the, the administrative uh, requirements, uh, the paperwork that we have to fill in, we, we have to have in order. And uh, meet meet the, the compliance requirement that our regulator is asking. Um, this is just going uh, to tell you a few things here. Uh, we are almost at the end of these slides, but um, here it's uh, what I I I think are the trends in wealth management. One is that uh, I'm sure you are you know a number of fintech companies all very exciting you can do a lot of things on your phone now with your app you know, unbelievable things you can do private banking has not evolved yet it has, to, it has a lot of catch up if you think about all these fintech invest a lot in the system and private banking invest a lot in people but less in the systems and they inherited the, the IT systems and they tr try to f to modify the existing system instead of going fall into a a, a, a a full change into into embracing the new technologies. So there's a lot of paper, still a lot of paper. You you ask a client, and, uh, maybe some of your parents are with some private banks that keep trying, uh, signing documents all the time, and sometimes they want the original, and you have to wait for the original to arrive. I mean, it's a nightmare. Um, that has to improve, and we have the, all, all the technology to do that. It's actually it's more secure than sending a DHL from, you name it, from Hong Kong to, to Zurich. Believe me, I mean, now in the, the digital technology would allow you a much more secure way to, to, to deal with all these requirements. Even the, how you communicate with your relationship manager, the client, typically communicate on the phone and email. In the UK, if you want to get fired, it's the easiest way to communicate you know, with WhatsApp with a client. <laughs> I mean, that's probably, it's, um, it's straight to the HR and uh, within the day, you're out having a coffee with, uh, with, <laughs> with someone else because clearly this is a, a something is, is taken very seriously, which has nothing to do with really what happened in private banking, but the other side of the sector of the private banking, the, the messaging, the secure messaging that did not allow a third party to double check was a really an area which exposed a lot of banks. So there's zero tolerance in that. 
And also there will be a much more information you can gather with your digital tools. Uh, I know that uh, I think you are planning to have uh, some speakers, I guess, on the ESG space, but it's a, now it's not a fashion. I mean, I think now everyone is very much into this. Uh, of course, a lot of ground has to be covered because everybody buys into the concept, but in reality, when you see how you measure, there's no a consistent adoption and uh, of, of what means in, uh, uh, to apply ESG investments. But definitely, there will be progress there. And also, I mentioned on the segmentation. As of now, they segment on the wealth and sometimes on the profession. But I give you an example. If I, if you, if you have a client that sold this, I don't know, as a private equity guy that made 200, 300 million on on the performance of the fund, is very different than somebody that sold this company. There was five generation in the textile industry. You cannot really say that they are the same thing. So clearly, uh, there will be a lot of AI there to really fine-tune the offering and what is relevant to clients. And that's probably, probably uh, the area we are, uh, we, are, um, we are going to. The last things I wanted to mention is, uh, actually the last two things is, first of all, this is, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but this is how, just an example how it's very difficult for a machine to replace a man or, 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 or a human being. Why? Because in this case, for instance, uh, this is it's a, it's a sanitized version of a transaction that one of the team, my team did. Is that for a client that had pockets of wealth with a private company, the private equities, a, a bond portfolio, a liquid portfolio, some commercial property, it was a beneficiary of trust, and some residential property. He wants to extract some equities because that was very liquid and pay back his, uh, one of his partners who wanted to go uh, to, to give the firm, uh, re restructure his debt and buy even uh, himself a, a private jet. You go to a bank, a normal bank, a commercial bank, they say, get lost. I can, I can actually uh, lend you against one thing or the other, this yes, no, no, yes. A private bank can take a, what I call a holistic approach. I said, well, as a matter of fact, if we combine all of this, we can take all of this and it will give you one facility. So you don't have to go shop around, just one. And with this, clearly there are benefits um, because you get a bit more money. Uh, your collateral, so the money that is secured uh, and is much more stable. If one goes down, maybe not all of them are going down. And you can do a lot of things uh, with that. And clearly, it's also uh, the rate, the lending rate, is typically cheaper than going just with one specific asset. And in this case, for instance, the, uh, the bank not only benefited by the fact that uh, the client was happy and could do whatever they wanted, but also had extra cash they invested in the portfolio. So uh, I wanted to finish uh, with the last thing, just uh, maybe a few, a few advice for people that are sort of uh, considering uh, uh, a wealth management career. First of all, it's a number game, so you have to apply to so many okay. firms. But eventually, um, uh, and you have to be, to do, you, like I was mentioning, do research for your prospect if you become a relationship manager, do your research because people usually go to the usual suspects, the big banks, but sometimes there are smaller outfits that are somewhat ignored. And uh, probably at the time, if you're lucky, you can get, and they might say, well, I need somebody uh, that helped me uh, in this, that. So it's a number game. You have to send a lot of, CVs in order to get uh, to get what uh, what um, you know to get your first job. Uh, reading, read what you're passionate about financial markets because in interviews that comes across as something very important. Podcasts, you no, know, there are so many podcasts now. Uh, uh, to name few that I actually personally actually listen to, one is called Money Maze, um, which is actually the interview. Uh, leading figures in the, in the investment world and private banks, and the uh, the, um, the the uh, this, um, the founder of this podcast asked very very intelligent questions and are very very informative of how people think. And also at the end, at the tail of each of these interviews, there always 
some advice for people that are considering moving their own industry. So it's, I find it very uh, interesting. There's another one called Trillions by Bloomberg, which is focused on ETFs. There's one on uh, billionaires, where again is on uh, sort of uh, family office type of investment. So there's so many, and it's a question of finding the one that you really like. Just try, try internship for free. That's important. Sometimes if you're a good person, even if you try for free, and you're uh, good and you get to know the people, sometimes something happens and they, they decided to keep you uh, to keep you for longer. And, uh, and industry qualification, sometimes when people, if you are committed and you really are interested, why not start immediately to get the qualifications? That gives a good signal to people, well, I'm committed, I really want. It's not just I'm sending a, a CV on wealth management, but actually what I really want is private equity. If you do that, if you have uh, the level four, for instance, means that you're really committed, you're passionate because you're doing something tangible about that. That really comes to a conclusion to, to our conversation. Happy to take any call. I'm Thank you so much. Time. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. We have time for, I think, seven minutes for questions. Any questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, you mentioned that now that a lot of it is based, so you focus on a particular market before you have like some South Africa, some India, some. Do you notice that because of that, like, there's obviously so many high net worths, ultra high net worths in the country, that you notice an increasing conflict of interest between those clients? In what sense, conflict of interest? Like, so say there's two ultra high net worths, both UK domiciled, that are uh, both one's trying to buy a business and one's trying to sell a business, or they're both trying to buy the same business, that, and they're both directly your clients. Have you noticed that's kind of on the rock? It rarely happened in my case. I must say that, as a matter of fact, when you work uh, in, especially in the, in, in the segment where I was, uh, which is the ultra high net worth, uh, clients tend to have position in other banks. So when you move to another place, you find the clients also there. <laughs> but I can tell you, we have a fiduciary duty. One of the biggest assets that the private banker has is trust. So I give you an example. Um, I, I, uh, um, I had two clients uh, which were a senior partner in a private equity firm. Uh, one actually was the chairman and the other one was the managing partner, so the top two guys. They never knew that that was the bank of the other. <laughs> I think discretion is very, very important. Uh, um, it's what clients expect. They, they don't want really you to speak about their personal circumstances to the other. Mm -hmm. So clearly when there are situations where there are some corporate issues, uh, in, especially in large organizations, there are teams that uh, help you in dealing with potential conflict of interest. And there are hundreds of pages, pages on how to deal with, with conflict of interest between clients and sometimes with the firm as well. Because sometimes the firm, has a mandate for somebody else, and you advise the client. But clearly, one, uh, that's the ba uh, what the banks have, did, have done, uh, that's quite, uh, that it's quite regimental, when you are all over the wall or not, i.e. whether you are in possession of information, and if you are in possession of information, you have to definitely uh, let, uh, let the bank know, or if you're not, so essentially you don't know, so you're not really in conflict. Uh, and if I may add, of course there's compliance, right? Um, uh, Rafael mentioned that this compliance function which is very important. So if you're more interested in the compliance side, and believe me, compliance is very strong, whether it's wealth management, private banking, or even corporate banking, the compliance officer will spot it immediately and you have an obligation as a regulated person Absolutely. to actually Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. Any other question? Yes. I want to ask about the qualifications. How long do you need to acquire like, an equivalent of a degree? No, no, no. It's actually... Um, I would say it depends the commitment and the time you spend. But uh, if you're familiar with the concept, financial concept, although it's taken from a different perspective, very much UK based, is the one I mentioned, I would say that uh, within three to five months, you can do level four, and between level four and level six, which is, I would say, the gold standard now, maximum six months. That's typically the, the issue. Sometimes is not very much the 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 the, the material, the length of the materials. Uh, it, unfortunately, now they decide instead of having exams every 
month, like for instance in the US, they don't even need a day, they do a, not really update it enough, but probably it's every three months. So if you skip one, you have to wait one or three months. So that's the inconvenience, but it's not the year, it's not the length of, a, of education. Any other questions? If there are no questions, then we can bring it to an end. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was very insightful. Thank you so much. So thank you for coming. And hope to see you soon. We have another event, I think, in a few days' time about ESG and conflicts of interest in ESG. So watch this space. Thank you so much. Thank you.